Hello and welcome to Finextra TV's Unplugged series. I'm Hannah Wallace and kindly joining me on the call now is a man with many titles but needs no introduction, Brett King. Hi Brett, how are you? Hey Hannah, good to be back on, uh, back on with you guys at Finextra. I know normally we would be face to face in the studio but it's still great to have you on the call nonetheless. So today we're going to be talking a bit about COVID-19's impact on the industry as a whole but also homing in on its impact on financial institutions, SMEs. We're going to be talking a bit about the recovery process following that and who will be the winners and losers. But before we get um, to some of your predictions, it would be good to set the scene and talk about where we are now and the lessons learned so far. Well, I think if you look um, both in the US and the UK, particularly where there's been sort of big stimulus, uh, uh, you know, payments and so forth going out, um, one characterization that Jen Tesha used, which I thought was great, is that um, the US is trying to fight this crisis, uh, um, you know, a 21st century crisis with a 20, 20th century or even 19th century, uh, um, you know, a process and system. Um, to, to tackling this. So, um, you know, even simple things like getting people stimulus checks has been, um, you know, a, a, a massive disaster from a, a process perspective because it still has relied very heavily on, um, you know, f physicality, face-to-face -face contact and so forth. So th this has really drawn attention to the big gaps um, in the system in respect to digitization. Um, you know, that, that's sort of the first, the first piece. Um, and, and secondly, it has shown more broadly at a macro basis just how unprepared we were for something like uh, COVID-19. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think the banks and large organisations did actually have measures in place to deal with a pandemic, just not one at this scale. Um, so it leads me on to my next question. What has been the impact on financial institutions? Well, you know, the, the first element is the working from home shift. That's been a big shift. And if you look at bank, um, you know, even Internet security group policy and things like that for many of the larger banks, you just weren't allowed as a as an employee to work from home on your home computer. That was uh, not possible from a security perspective. And so from day one of, of the stay at home orders in the United States, you have uh, companies like JP Morgan Chase having to register 117,000 people on Zoom for the first time just to continue to function. And so um, I, I, I don't think they were even remotely prepared for this from a, a working practice perspective. Um, and that's obviously going to change the way th things uh, proceed from here because I think many will realize they don't have to have that uh, working from the office uh, um, reliance uh, in the future. So that's that's one aspect. In terms of the bank branches, well, um, obviously for m most of the Western world, people haven't been able to physically go to a, a bank branch. In some states in the United States, bank branches have been considered essential services as stayed open. But, um, you know, even then you've got them putting tape down on the floor and things like that to try and, uh, um, you know, support social distancing and things. It's been very clumsy. But, um, you know, there's a real question as to whether people will want to go back into bank branches uh, in the, the medium term after this happens, still wary of, um, you know, gathering in, in potential places. It's, I think, you know, for commercial real estate, this is going to be pretty devastating because it's not just bank yeah. branches that will face that, but, uh, you know, retail stores as well. Um, and of course, the ability to have that level of support you would typically get from a bank branch on your digital platform is a challenge because while banks have invested in digital, they've invested mostly in self-service capabilities and not broader you know, relationship and engagement tools, generally speaking. And so, again, um, you know, th this this bias they've had towards, well, this is the face-to-face -face world and this is what we do at the bank branches and this is what we do on digital and we don't want those two to cross over because that might reduce the uh, um, the attractiveness of, of branch operations has, has uh, been a, a strategy that's failed at this time. All right, well, what about cybersecurities and other issues that have risen as a result of the pandemic. What are some of the challenges we're looking at? Uh, look, I, de I, I, I 
Definitely identity theft is spiking. Um, you know, we definitely have some cybersecurity risks that are spiking. Um, you know, you've got um, elderly people, for for example, using, um, you know, internet banking for the first time. There's a lot of risk of phishing, um, you know, uh, compromising their uh, financial well-being. And so there definitely are issues. Where this has, again, emphasized, and this is something we're well aware of before COVID-19, but it has emphasized the fact that that our security is based on identity metrics that are fairly easily compromised these days. So it does draw to attention the fact that we still need to solve that problem of identity. Um, and, mm -hmm. and in that respect, China has fared a little better than um, the, the Western uh, world because you know they've been putting in place uh, digital identity structure for um, about four years now and so um, you know with facial recognition with fingerprint and voice recognition as sort of a, a, a basic part of their uh, their their system which we we don't have as yet in the US integrated into things like uh, banking and government services so that's that's one aspect on the broader mm -hmm. cybersecurity um, side of things, I think um, you know it's it's also brought a boon to companies working in that space and players working in that space. They're they're pretty busy right now, so I think um, you know overall, hopefully, we come out of this with um, with some uh, more focus on that. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say cybercrime is on the up. Just this morning, I was helping my dad who'd just been hacked. Um, but all right, what about the businesses and SMEs then? How are they being impacted and what kind of recovery process are we looking at? Well, you know, it, there's still a bit of a question as to whether, you know, we will come back and sort of restore activity, um, you know, fairly quickly or whether it's going to be sort of the W-based recovery, you know, the, the, the spike and then the stay at home and the spike and stay at home again, sort of the long tail of this. Um, there's also aspects of whether the virus weakens. So I can't really talk to that. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I can, you know, that one, of, one of the things that is fairly clear now is that there are a lot of small businesses that are going to go under during this uh, period. And the ability of those small businesses to just to come back when the economy opens up is a question. So um, certainly, I think we're going to see more consolidation in um, businesses that were able to sort of operate or maintain their operations uh, in some form during this. So their ability to rely on digital again, Amazon certainly going to be a big winner out of this. And I know we're going to talk about winners and losers more broadly um, here, but um, e-commerce generally has gone up, uh, you know, in the United States, I think it's 19% in terms of uh, online um, shopping. Um, and so all aspects of digital have really been enhanced during this this process. Of course, the the real question is, do people, once they see that level of convenience and they've used digital in that way, do they then just go, oh, we're going to just go back to the old way of doing things? Or will they see um, some benefit in the continuity of sort of that digital lifestyle? And that, that's a big question for banks as well. Um, because, mm -hmm. you know, we've been talking about this shift to digital for a long time, but that behavioral element, maybe it just needed that sort of kickstart of people using these tools for the first time. And once they find out how easy it is to do it, then that could represent a permanent behavioral shift in terms of the way they they consume and, um, and behave. But um, at the same time, um, once we are truly over this, there may be more of a renaissance to go back to support small businesses and small retail stores and things like that um, out of uh, more of a, a grassroots movement um, from people yeah. you know, wanting to sort of give back to the community and small business. Ironically, I think actually some community banks here in the US may do quite well out of that. Um, primarily because when it came to these uh, PPP payments, we call them in the United States, um, the the uh, the community banks responded, some community respe banks responded very well on this, um, comparative to the likes of Bank of America and others who um, just um, basically decided to lend that money out to their best um, and biggest customers rather than small businesses. So, um, mm. Yeah, whereas the community banks honestly tackled it. So I think, um, you know, on the banking side, there's uh, 
that could be a surprise effect which could give some support. I don't think it's a necessarily a broad, uh, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily um, stay true for every one of uh, the community banks in the U.S., but there's certainly some community banks will come out as uh, as winners of this. But on the retail mm-hmm. side, this is a big question. You know, we've got a lot of commercial uh, property por- uh, portfolios and, and lending out there and, um, you know, these big shopping malls that have been empty for a long time, um, you know, commercial rent and, uh, you know, not being able to be paid by small businesses and things like that. There's some very, very big questions about that side of the economy. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an interesting area to look at, isn't it? The stage following the government's fiscal response to improve liquidity and the analogy of the London fires actually springs to mind, where the issue is gave money to those building London back up on the condition that they would build it in stone rather than straw. So how can we ensure a long term benefit rather than a short term gain? Well, the biggest problem broadly with what we've faced, I think, during this crisis has been um, that there has been the potential for accentuation of inequality through this period. Um, I just saw a report this morning that the world's billionaires have uh, increased their um, net worth by $298 billion uh, throughout this crisis, uh, uh, you know, um, ironically. Um, And so uh, whereas you've got these broad parts of you know, population in the US where these guys are basically, you know, they're now um, suffering food anxiety. They, they're, they're marching, you know, they're doing marches on the weekends, uh, um, you know, to, to talk about, um, you know, protests uh, around rents and, and opening up the economy again so they can get working. And so there's a big social cost to this. And, and how that informs policy and process uh, moving forward is a real question. How will we identify brands that have you know, acted responsibly and those that haven't during this process? So, you know, brands that have said, we'll stick with you, we'll give you a break, you know, instead of taking your uh, stimulus check and using it to pay off your overdraft or your credit card that you owe us, we'll just give you that money into into the uh, the account and carry your, your overdraft forward and things like that. Um, you know, from a banking perspective. And for other brands, you know, that ha- have shown um, a social connection to customers have made these right moves, I-, I think we'll remember that after this. And I think there is generally going to be sort of this awareness that people at the poor end of the spectrum were hit a lot, lot harder um, by COVID-19 than people, you know, in the the top part of the uh, the, you know, the spectrum, the one percent, and and mm-hmm. that's going to raise some very real questions about the fact that the economy and and the capitalist system that we live in, you know, when cor- it, coronavirus came along, it just took a matter of weeks for that really to fall apart at the seams where. You know, these people that were most vulnerable in the system were hit the hardest. And we have to really ask some questions about the design of that system and whether those metrics that we've had for those longest times, the KPIs on market performance, like the stock market uh, numbers, which are still high at the moment, uh, um, you know, at at record highs, really, um, you know, that has a real disconnect with the day to day economy um, for the majority of the population. And so we have to start thinking about realigning that what's the purpose of the economy if it's not to support the nation as a whole, and that includes these basic services like healthcare and uh, making sure you have a roof over your head and and, um, you have enough food to eat. So that's why we've seen things like Spain experimenting with universal basic income and the stimulus checks and things like that. And, And these uh, elements of support um, may be more necessary to look at uh, on a permanent basis as a result of this crisis, particularly because um, while COVID-19 is a stimulus for this at this time, if it wasn't COVID-19, it could very well have been artificial intelligence with technology based on employment or rising sea levels and climate change and you know, um, you know, population displacement and things like that. Uh, all of those sorts of things, if it wasn't a pandemic, could also have had a 
very much the same economic impact to society. So we're looking at some big fundamental philosophical questions. Okay. okay, well, that leads me quite nicely into my last question then about who will be the winners and losers. I know this is a question I've put to you before, but I want to see if your views have changed in the context of COVID-19. Yeah, well, um, this is actually quite interesting because, um, you know, for the big techs and Silicon Valley more broadly, um, what it has um, sort of emphasized is the fact that when you're talking about pure consumerism and, you know, technologies that you can sh consume, like an iPhone, um, you know, there's Silicon Valley has been very focused on what is the next, biz next business that we can build that can scale up very rapidly that can get people to adopt. But, you know, in the midst of this, having a brand new iPhone with a more powerful camera or having access to, you know, social media or, you know, being able to upload your videos, those things were not substantive improvements from a societal perspective that enabled us to navigate COVID-19 or coronavirus better. And so there's a real question right now as to whether big techs are doing the big, solving the big problems. Um, now, you know, there are organizations like Google, for example, with their X Prize and the Moonshot projects and stuff like that, that have been a bit more out there. And I think as we emerge from this, I think you're going to see Silicon Valley having to again, have more of a social consciousness about what they're doing, not just bringing people together with tech, like in the case of social media, but what are we doing to lower the cost of uh, housing so we don't have homelessness? What are we doing to um, improve the way people can work from home so that um, small businesses are able to do that um, remotely? You know, what are we doing in terms of healthcare? In mm -hmm. terms of the technology you can wear on your body or having your, your phone that can um, help us with uh, tackling this sort of thing if it happens again. So I think there's going to be, um, br more broadly speaking, I hope there's a social push that comes out of this. And so that then extends to um, the banking world and things like that. So in, you know, we, we have very real problems in the banking world in respect to things like just using cash, which could be a, a transmission vector for the virus um, and the lack of digital support that we've seen. And so um, the sort of things we've been talking about for a long time, I've certainly been talking about for a long time, <laughs> um, you know, we are seeing an acceleration of this digital adoption as, as a requisite of, uh, you know, a coronavirus. But the the real question is, is, you know, how we now get serious about this in terms of supporting this on a long, long term systemic uh, change basis. So that the winners and losers out of this, obviously, the winners are those that have already invested in that and already decided to make those changes. And the losers are those that thought, um, you know, at the start of coronavirus, it's, you know, it's just going to go back to normal at the end of this, um, you know, or, or, and, and who weren't really prepared. And so I think that, you know, that's going to be clear, but I, I, I think it's not the technology per se that we will come out of this thinking about or the digitization per se. I think it will be how we use technology to fix these broader social issues that have been raised or um, you know, emphasized as a result of, of COVID-19 more generally. And, and I'm hopeful that we come to this point and I call it techno-socialism. Um, which is where this technology is used to create this um, enhanced social consciousness where we can provide for people who really got hit the hardest during this crisis. And, and the same who would be uh, uh, victims of um, the likes of um, you know, mm -hmm. te uh, technology-based unemployment and climate change. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the biggest problem we have at the core of that is just the massive inequality in many of the Western uh, democracies and economies that we have right now that it's been um, exposed and, and um, you know, uh, unfortunately uh, accentuated during the crisis. Well, Brett, as expected, um, I've got a lot more questions for you following this interview, but we'll leave it there. And I'm sure we'll be meeting you again soon to talk about the impact of COVID-19. Um, but for now, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, I'd enjoy that, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you again.